Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to UUSF Forum. It's great to see you all here. Um, if you haven't already gotten your breakfast, please do so. I want to remember and, and call your attention to the fact that Melvin Starks, who has been lovingly providing the breakfast part of this event for years and been involved in for much, much longer than me, uh, is in need of our thoughts and prayers right now. He's in the hospital. And if you want to know more about uh, the situation with Melvin, please do speak to Bruce, who I don't see here yet, but I'm sure Bruce will be here before too long. Um, Robin Larson has graciously stepped in uh, to the role of, of putting on this very nice breakfast for you today. So let's appreciate Robin for doing that. Yeah. Uh, just a few announcements as we begin. Uh, we do have forum the next three Sundays after today. So a week from today, we have Professor Anthony D'Agostino, who's from uh, San Francisco State. He'll be talking about Ukraine and Russia, which is a hot issue, obviously. He's going to raise our awareness about how perilous the situation is really right now. We could be on the brink of something catastrophic happening there. The weekend after that, we have Joyce Lehrer, who's going to speak about a project, uh, social justice and masculinities. I'm not giving you a proper overview of that topic, but it sounds like a very interesting and uh, relevant topic to the Human Rights Group, which is the committee that produces Forum. Uh, by the way, I am Jeff Peckerel. I didn't say that. And I'm co-chair of the Human Rights Working Group, along with Dolores perez Helbrun, who's going to do the Ohlone recognition in just a minute. Uh, so we have even more sessions beyond that, which I'll recap for you at the end of the meeting today. Uh, I want to especially uh, mention that at one o'clock here in this room, we hope you'll come back for a very special event that we have planned, which is a fundraiser for the Janine Freedom Theater, which is a wonderful, wonderful charity. Uh, it's an acting school and playhouse located in the occupied West Bank in the city of Janine. And uh, yes, we have lunch for you at one o'clock. You'll learn about the Janine Freedom Theater. We also have poetry readings and a nice slideshow, which uh, Bruce has arranged all of that here at one o'clock. So please do come back for that. Um, before we do the Ohlone recognition, I want to uh, remind you about a few things about how we do forum. Please don't use any language which could be interpreted as demeaning to the speaker, the audience, or other groups. Do participate by raising your hand to be recognized, identify yourself by name, talking about questions. Please use the cards on the table, and I don't see them, so I'll be getting those on the table before it's Q&A time, so stay tuned for that. Listen to and respect other points of view, and once you've spoken, let others speak. So let's don't dominate the Q&A session if you're inclined to do so. And finally, our, our presenter today, who is... Um, remote. He's actually in Sweden. So Stephen Zunes will be joining us from the screen in just a minute, and he is in Sweden. Okay. Dolores, would you do the Ohlone recognition, please? Thank you, Jeff. We, the members of the First Unitarian Universal Society of San Francisco, acknowledge that our community is located on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone tribes, the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that we benefit from living and working here, and we affirm their sovereign rights as First Peoples. The Greater Bay Area is also the ancestral territory of the Miwok, Yokuts, Patwin, and other tribes. As the original stewards of this land, the indigenous peoples understood the interconnectedness of all things and maintained harmony with nature for millennia. We honor them now for their enduring commitment to our Mother Earth. Thank you. Okay. I in a moment when I go back to my seat, I'll put Professor Zunes on the screen. I'll just be a do a quick intro of him. He is a professor, I believe, of history and political science at the University of San Francisco. We had him here a year ago and he gave an amazing talk on the same similar topic of US foreign policy in the Middle East, especially as it relates to Israel and Palestine. So if, without further ado, I will give the screen to Professor Zunes. 
Hello, everybody, <clears throat> and thank you for inviting me. I am currently uh, uh, in Sweden as a, a visiting uh, professor at the University of Gothenburg, and will be returning uh, to my teaching duties at the uh, University of San Francisco in in the in the fall. Uh, I wanted to. Uh, Let's start. I, I, I mean, I, I um, been asked to talk about the Middle East. We, we, in U.S. policy. We, we arranged this several months ago, but um, I will fo be focusing primarily on the Gaza war, and uh, we, can, I'll be, I'll be happy to talk about uh, uh, address issues, broader issues about U.S. policy in the region, uh, as well. Just want to start off by observing that the uh, U.S.-backed Israeli war on Gaza has killed more civilians in the shortest amount of time than any conflict uh, since the Rwandan genocide. Uh, we're looking at 32,000 deaths, at least three quarters of whom have been civilians. And these include over 12,000 children. Um, Israel's committed multiple war crimes, uh, attacking pr protected sites like schools, hospitals, and mosques, um, shoot, uh, snipers shooting children, uh, directing women and children to supposedly safe zones and then shooting out or bombing both the routes to those places and the sites themselves, uh, the destruction of ancient historical sites, uh, targeting uh, 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 journalists, um, uh, 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 aid workers, uh, health professionals, um, and, and, and others. Um, and uh, the Israelis have not only bombed every university in Gaza, they've systematically destroyed most of the academic buildings through controlled demolitions as, as, as part of the Netanyahu's government to basically obliterate uh, civil life of Palestinians in the territory. Uh, despite this, uh, Biden has uh, re rejected calls from Congress and, and uh, human rights groups and the international community, and according to polls, the majority of Americans, by continuing to provide unconditional uh, military aid and, and arms sales to uh, Israel. Just a, a week and a half ago, uh, the Washington Post reported Biden has agreed to ship Israel an additional 1,800 MK-84 bombs. These, these weigh roughly 2,000 pounds, and they're powerful enough to level an entire apartment block and leave a crater 35 feet deep. And Israel's killed hundreds of civilians in recent months using these weapons. Um, Human Rights Watch just came out uh, with a report a few days ago that talked about one particular incident where there was no apparent military target anywhere close, and they destroyed an entire apartment building, killing 106 uh, people, and including uh, nearly 50 children. And just this past uh, week after Israeli forces killed hundreds of more civilians, including scores at a hospital and uh, seven aid workers, including an American, a White House spokesperson reiterated the Biden administration would not condition military aid to Israel because, quote, we believe the approach we are taking is working. And um, <clears throat> indeed, you know, though Biden protested the killing of the aid workers and pressured Israel to allow more foreign aid and humanitarian aid in, a senior administration official to to told Politico on Wednesday that Biden's public statement was all we have planned when it came to holding Israel accountable. Uh, the US has refused to uh, uh, have an independent investigation, basically trusting Israel's investigation. They say it was just an accident. They thought they were terrorists. Uh, and this is despite the uh, the fact that these the, the these aid workers were in three separate cars. They attacked. They destroyed the first car. The second car came along. They they got one or two of the survivors in the second car. Then that got attacked uh, about half uh, 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 a, a quarter mile later, or half mile later, and then. The uh, other car picked up the survivors of that one, and that one got blown up a few hundred yards down the road from there. Um, and the, the, we, we've been getting a lot of attention has been on Gaza, of, 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 of course, but there's been increased repression in the West Bank. Um, you know, 300 Palestinians, vast majority of civilians, have been killed in the West Bank, including uh, a couple, two 17-year-old U.S. citizens who were shot in the back of the head. Again. <laughs> One was just driving. One was was, was hanging out with a friend. <laughs> um, you know, no no arms or anything like that. Uh, you mentioned the Janine Theater. The Israelis raided the theater a couple of months ago, um, arrested the artistic director and a bunch of other people, and totally trashed the place again for no apparent reason. 
Um, I mean, what we're seeing is a situation, some of you may remember from the 1980s in, in, in Central America when, when the U.S. was providing arms to, Sal to El Salvador, you know, despite the death squads, despite the massacres, despite the large scale killing and, uh, and, and to the Contras, who, which essentially were a terrorist group that was uh, attacking cooperatives and, and villages in northern Nicaragua and Nicaragua, again, primarily civilian targets. And the U.S. went similarly in the uh, um, isolated international community. Um, like Reagan, Biden has been willing to stretch the truth uh, quite a bit to justify things. I mean, for example, the, the, the terrorist attacks on October 7th, I mean, they're really horrific. I lost a friend who was actually a, a peace activist <laughs> um, who um, in that, uh, um, you know, in the terrorist attack. But Biden insisted on exaggerating, claiming that he'd seen photos that of, of, that, of Hamas beheading uh, children. Um, later, the White House admitted there were no such photos. There were no such evidence that they had uh, children. He justified the Israeli attack on the Al Shifa hospital, saying they had evidence it was a Hamas military base. The Washington Post you know, came out and said there was no evidence of a military headquarters, a military base, any substantial Hamas operations there. Uh, Biden has questioned the numbers uh, put out by uh, health officials in, in Gaza of the um, of the death toll. Though the State Department later acknowledged that they found them reliable. <laughs> Um, he also insisted that the high civilian casualties were uh, due to Hamas using human shields. But Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, others have, have found hardly any evidence of, of, uh, of Hamas using human shields. Uh, that and indeed most of the you know, they've had had some fighters and, and equipment, you know, closer than they should be to civilians, but not human shields as is defined international law as you know holding people against their will. Interestingly, Nancy Pelosi a few years ago pushed through a resolution that uh, redefined human shields to mean Hamas having uh, fighters or officials in civilian neighborhoods, but, you know, uh, or, or in civilian hospitals and, and, and the like. And, but, you know, Hamas, in addition to being a terrorist group, uh, is, is, it was, it has been the de facto government of, of Gaza since they seized power by force back in 2005, 2006. And, um, they uh, and you know and government officials they live in civilian neighborhoods like government officials in in, in other countries. Uh, the fight the Hamas is a militia, not a standing army, so the fighters live at home. So basically, uh, Pelosi was trying to make the case that you know all this, you know that 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 Gaza is a free fire zone, you know, because uh, Hamas officials live in these neighborhoods, therefore they are all legitimate um, um, you know uh, targets. Um, Though actually, under international law, even if even if um, uh, Hamas was using human shields by the narrow definition, it's still illegal to to bomb them. It's like to use a domestic example: if uh, there was a bank robbery and the bad guys ended up holding uh, bank personnel, uh, bank staff, and and and, and uh, customers hostage and shooting out to the street at the police, you know, the police couldn't come in. SWAT team couldn't come in and just massacre every kill everybody and say, "Oh, it's not their fault, our fault." You know, they were using human shields, you know, so, um, but, you know, the, the, I mean, Netanyahu and Biden wants to believe that all 203 aid workers, all 685 health professionals, all 284 educators, and all 136 journalists who have been killed in Gaza by Israeli strikes were either simply accidents or they were actually terrorists. Um, and, um, and similarly, Biden and his supporters have tried to claim that Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, the UN Human Rights Council, Positions for Human Rights, that is Sans Frontier, and all the all these groups, which have repeatedly documented war crimes by other countries like Syria, Sudan, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey, but they, 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 uh, Biden supporters are saying they're all biased when it comes, and that should not be taken seriously if they also document war crimes by uh, by Israel. And as with Israel, the International Court of Justice ordered Syria to implement provisional measures in ceasing their ongoing violations of humanitarian law. And like Israel, Syria is violating that order. But unlike Israel, the United States has placed strict sanctions on Syria, and it isn't accusing the World Court of bias and demanding adherence to fundamental human rights. I mean, in the view of Biden administration, this is a theme I'll be talking about this, this morning, um, 
is that international law should only apply to adversaries, not allies. I mean, the Biden Biden's ambassador to Israel just a couple of weeks ago said that Israel is following American and international law in its handling of weapons and humanitarian aid and its offensive in Gaza, despite extensive evidence to the contrary. And despite the views of most career State Department officials familiar with the situation who recognize that Israel's actions are indeed violating U.S. law. And uh, just last week, uh, Matthew Miller, uh, the Biden State Department spokesperson, said, quote, we have not found Israel to be in violation of international humanitarian law, either when it comes to the conduct of the war or when it comes to the revision of humanitarian assistance. This, of course, is a brazen lie to enable U.S. arms to continue to flow, and the world knows it. Again, to, to, to go back to the 1980s, uh, Congress passed these human rights requirements for um, El Salvador to receive military aid. Uh, but they left it to the, Biden, to, the, to the Reagan administration to determine whether El Salvador was doing that. So every six months, Reagan would say, oh, El Salvador is improving the human rights situation, <clears throat> even as the mass killings by that U.S.-backed government continued. Um, <clears throat> the, um, uh, uh, the United States, uh, <clears throat> um, I mean, the, the other thing is that we're hearing is that Hamas is is is, uh, is not only responsible for the atrocities it committed on October seventh, but subsequent Israeli atrocities as well. They're saying, well, you know, and I keep I've seen these tweets from various uh, members of Congress, both parties, and you know, they're saying things like, you know, they're responsible for every single death because Israel wouldn't be doing this if Hamas hadn't attacked. Now <clears throat> that. That not only ignores, of course, the you know one could uh, it's, it's the flip side of those who say you know Israel is responsible for the terrorist attacks on October seventh because of their oppression and 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 ethnic cleansing and occupation and and you know all the terrible things they've done to the Palestinians. But both of these extremes comes in the face of centuries of Western jurisprudence, which recognizes that crimes cannot be justified by um, another's provocations. But again, it's an illustration that just how extreme even people in the Democratic Party have come when it com comes to trying to justify uh, U.S. support for um, Israeli war crimes. Now, the United States, of course, uh, under Biden is isolated, terribly isolated in the international community. Uh, Biden has voted three, vetoed three U.N. Security Council resolutions calling for a ceasefire. Uh, the only dissenting vote in the 15-member um, um, uh, UN Security Council. Uh, the United States was one of only 10 members of the 193-member UN General Assembly to vote against uh, a, a ceasefire. I mean, we're, we're, we're two, uh, uh, and, and, and those 10 were um, small was or Israel, small Pacific island states dependent on U.S. aid, and a couple of right-wing wing governments. I mean, only one other NATO country <laughs> um, uh, voted uh, against the resolution. I mean, here, here in Europe, I mean, people are just stunned at, at, at just how extreme the Biden administration is. Now, on March 25th, you know, uh, the United States, UN Security Council did pass a resolution that called for a bilateral ceasefire for the remaining two weeks of Ramadan, along with um, other provisions. Uh, and it made headlines in large part because the United States did not veto it as it had previous resolutions calling for a ceasefire, but but, the, but Biden had no intention for the resolution to take effect. Um, the US was the only country in the uh, UN, uh, in the Security Council to not vote in favor. It was just an abstention. Again, the US was isolated. The U.S. had threatened to veto the original draft of the resolution calling for a permanent ceasefire and only agreed to not cast a veto in return for dropping the word um, permanent. But, uh, you know, despite the, all the attention it gave, uh, White House spokesperson John Kirby insisted that nothing has changed about our policy towards Gaza, nothing. Um, but the, the um, U.S. made clear immediately they didn't, would not allow this resolution to be enforced. Uh, U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Greenfield-Thomas, echoed by other Biden administration officials, 
insisted that the resolution was somehow non-binding. I mean, this led to a storm of protests, including from conservative allies like Great Britain, who cited Article 25 of the UN Charter, which declares that members of the United Nations agree to accept and carry out the decisions of the Security Council in accordance with the present charter. And indeed, a landmark 1971 decision by the International Court of Justice confirmed that Security Council resolutions are indeed binding under international law. And you know, there's a broad consensus of international legal scholars that such resolutions are obligatory, particularly when the language of the resolution includes the word demands in the operational clauses. Um, and they, 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 despite this, they are not enforceable unless enacted under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, which the United States has refused to allow in the case of Israel and other allies. And so the, this, 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 the Biden administration's audacious claim that UN Security Council resolutions are non-binding is not simply a means of relieving pressure on Israel's right-wing government, but it, it's, it's frankly an, an attempt to undermine the international legal order in place since the Second World War. Um, by allowing the resolution to pass, therefore, Biden is trying to convince voters he supports a ceasefire, even while he simultaneously prevents the United Nations from enforcing its resolution and continues to provide Israel with the means to, to uh, violate it. Um, the, a more recent development is that Biden does appear to have convinced Netanyahu to change a policy, and that is to open up the Erez crossing to allow more relief uh, convoys to come in. Um, and uh, it, it appears that, that Biden may have threatened some specific action if Israel did not comply. This is in response, of course, to the killing of the uh, uh, seven humanitarian workers with the uh, World Central uh, Kitchen. Um, and um, But it, it, it raises the question as to why the United States hasn't taken such firm action sooner and why Biden is still unwilling to force Israel to agree to a ceasefire. Despite the efforts by uh, Biden and his supporters to give the impression the United States is powerless to end the war, history shows otherwise. The, it, the Biden administration has the power to stop Israel's offensive. Though Congress authorizes middle, uh, military aid, the president has the authority under the Arms Control, Arms Export Control Act to withhold or threaten to withhold U.S. military aid when the recipient nation violates U.S. or international law. In terms of the international legal system, Israel is currently violating the Fourth Geneva Convention uh, regarding the treatment of civilians in wartime, among other a number of other statutes, and is violating uh, the recently passed Resolution 2728, which demands an immediate ceasefire. Israel is also in violation of Section 502 B.C. of the 1961 Foreign Assistance Act, which prohibits aids to countries that prevent access to humanitarian relief supplies. Also in violation of the 1999 Leahy Amendment, which prohibits funding foreign security forces engaged in the commission of gross violations of human rights, and it violates Biden's own National Security Memorandum 20, which requires U.S. security partners to provide written assurances that they will use U.S. military assistance in accordance with international law and facilitate humanitarian aid. Instead, Biden has utilized emergency powers to bypass public congressional oversight and providing Netanyahu arms with U.S. stockpiles overseas including Hellfire missiles, bunker-busting bombs, and, and, and other weapons, which have had such a devastating effect on civilian popu uh, population. And, and just a week and a half ago, his administration approved, you know, uh, you know uh, um, the, 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 uh, he signed into law a bill with uh, adding $3.8 billion of military aid to Israel unconditionally. And, and this is despite polls that show a majority of Americans, including a vast majority of Democrats, support withholding military aid to Israel. And so pressuring, the thing is, pressuring Israel through suspending military aid would not have to be a political decision that could leave Biden open to charges from Republicans that he was somehow abandoning Israel. He could just simply point out correctly 
that he has no choice but to follow the law. Um, and though Biden has refused to use his considerable leverage to stop the bombing, several pa past presidents have successfully ended Israeli military campaigns by threatening to withhold um, military uh, aid and, 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 and other pressure. Um, for example, um, uh, President Eisenhower forced Israel, when they, after Israel did its first uh, occupation of, of Gaza, along with the uh, parts of Egypt, Sinai Peninsula, Eisenhower forced Israel to withdraw uh, by, by threatening uh, the uh, uh, economic aid that was going in at the time. Uh, the U.S. wasn't giving military aid at that point. Um, uh, we, we have uh, uh, Nixon in, in 1973 and the October War. We had Carter in the first invasion of Lebanon in 1978, very explicit about uh, uh, he'd have to have to cut off aid because it violated U.S. law. Um, even Reagan uh, during uh, to, uh, for, you know, to uh, force Israel to withdraw from most of its occupied territory uh, in Lebanon, uh, Obama on, on two occasions during Israel's previous wars on on, on Gaza. So um, you know it is is possible uh, um, a, uh, he could uh, Biden could use that leverage, but he's chosen not to. And again, large majorities of Americans uh, oppose Israel's war, oppose uh, unconditional aid. Uh, the polls show, you know, that among Democrats at least, there's more sympathy for the Palestinians than there is for Israelis. Three times as many Democrats believe that Israel's gone too far in its military actions, and its military actions are not justified, than believe that Israel is simply defending its interests and it, it, it's, its military actions are justified. And yet the Democratic administration and the vast majority of Democrats in Congress say just the opposite. Majority of Americans support a ceasefire, including 80% of, 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 of Democrats. But um, you're, uh, to my last count, maybe 20, 25% of, uh, of uh, I think more like 20% of Democrats in Congress support um, a ceasefire. A poll from The Economist showed that 50% of Democratic voters believe Israel is committing genocide against Palestinian civilians, while 30% say they aren't sure. That leaves only one in five Democrats who think a Democratic president isn't actively supporting a foreign government committing genocide. Meanwhile, the Catholic Church, the Orthodox Church, the Anglican Church, and, 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 and most mainstream Protestant churches have come out with strong, have come out calling for a ceasefire. The Unitarians uh, you know, uh, came out with a strong statement a couple months ago. In fact, only the fundamentalists, only the right-wing evangelicals have come out explicitly supporting uh, Israel's war and U.S. support for the war. So what we're seeing then is that Biden and congressional leaders are siding with the fundamentalists. I mean, this is actually similar to the Iraq war where all these churches also came out against the war, but Biden and Schumer and Schiff um, ended up siding with the fundamentalists there as well. And it gets me thinking, and this is just a little aside here, that, that you know, can you imagine if, if Biden and Democratic congressional leaders sided with the fundamentalists on abortion or LGBTQ rights or, 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 or other issues? And in this case, in the war and peace issue, we actually have the Catholic, Catholics and Orthodox on our side. You know? But you know, apparently, Democrats can be very forgiving of their leaders when on uh, when they when they side with the fundamentalists on, on on issues of war and peace. Anyway, uh, turning to American labor unions, they've traditionally been strongly pro israel but even they can no longer tolerate the carnage. With over two hundred unions now on record calling for an immediate and permanent ceasefire, and the reaction. You know, the reaction has been what? It has been, um, you know, I mean, it kind of, I don't know if you remember the movie Bullworth, uh, uh, with this uh, 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 Democratic senator was speaking as a black church, and he kind of admitted that, you know, that, uh, you know, they're, they're just, they don't care about the black community, really. They're just after it's supporting the interests of powerful business or whatever, and people start yelling at him, and he says, what are you going to do, vote Republican? And you know that is sort of the uh, attitude uh, that um, you know we are um, um, we're hearing 
from the um, from the Democrats right now. Um, it could have a um, real negative impact on the uh, election, though, uh, because uh, we, I mean this could be a repeat of 1968. You know when the vast majority of Democrats opposed the Vietnam War, but the Democrats had a pro. Uh, war nominee 2004 most democrats oppose the iraq war the democrats nominate a pro-war nominee and they lost to um weak republican opponents uh, because a lot of people especially young people uh stayed home i mean young yeah as political scientists i can tell you and young uh, youth turnout is high democrats win youth uh um turnout is low democrats lose and what i've been hearing from my students back in california what i've been hearing from uh, you know, my adult kids and their friends is you know it's like I'm not voting for genocide, Joe. I mean they're just really, uh, really clear about this and and very passionate about this. That uh, you know it's, they're not asking for, for, for perfection. They're just asking not to support genocide. And it doesn't seem like too low a bar. We can argue all we want about how it's not rational, it's not strategic. You know, given the very real threat of a Trump presidency, but the polling numbers. I mean, among you know youth. Uh, his his uh, uh, Biden's uh, uh, approval rate has plummeted to 25 percent. Among Arab Americans, a key voting bloc in Pennsylvania and Michigan, two key swing states, he's gone from 59 percent to 19 percent. Uh, true with other other minor um, other minority groups and American Muslims and and progressives. I mean, and and even even if people even if a lot of these people go and vote for Biden anyway. You know, they're not going to donate money or do the get out the vote work or a lot of the you know the, the 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 enthusiasm you really need to get the kind of turnout to defeat Republicans and and so this is a, it's a very very real chance that um, this could um, end up you know uh, giving us a, a Trump presidency and all the terrible things that um, uh, that indeed uh, you know will you know come from that. Um, I should I should note that uh, Biden is to the right of elite opinion as well. Um, uh, the uh, career people in the State Department who are familiar with the Middle East, vast majority, a good eighty percent or more, oppose what he's doing. There have been a series of resignations that some of you uh, may have heard. Among Middle East scholars, I'd say at least ninety percent are opposed to um, uh, what Biden is is doing. Again, these are similar figures from the from the Iraq War, which uh, Biden also supported. Um, and, um, and internationally, um, you know, the, uh, as, as I mentioned, there's, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the United States is really, really a, an outlier here. And, um, but, you know, the, and it's not just supporting, uh, Israel's war. I mean, but, you know, it's the question is, it's about humanitarian aid. Um, I mean, like, in January, Israel claimed, without any evidence that I've seen, that a dozen uh, uh, employees of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, which is Christ critical, you know, healthcare, housing, education, food, food particularly important not currently for Palestinian um, uh, uh, refugees, uh, that that they came to claim that a dozen of their employees played a role in the October seventh terrorist attack. Again, they haven't shown evidence of this. But, but uh, maybe it's true. But let's remember that UNRWA employs 30,000 people. And I should mention UNRWA immediately suspended these people uh, that were accused. But anyway, UNRWA uh, um, employs 30,000 people. Uh, not, not just in the Gaza Strip, but in Lebanon, in Syria, in Jordan, in the West Bank. But because of these unproven ac accusations of 12 out of 30,000 employees, Biden halted all U.S. funding for that U.N. body. And then both houses of Congress just a couple of weeks ago voted by a large bipartisan majority to permanently end all funding to UNRWA and its humanitarian work. Um, and this is particularly, uh, 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 and, and the U.S. You know, provides a good 20% of their funding, uh, as it does of other U.N. agencies. Um, funding for U.N. agencies is allocated based on the percentage of the gross world product. Um, but or, or there, I'm sorry, they're they're um, um yeah. Uh, anyway, the and and with the murder of the World Central Kitchen people, and there is a fair amount of evidence they were deliberately targeted by Israel. 
They and most other humanitarian groups fearing for the safety of their staff have withdrawn as well. Um, and the and uh, the um, U.S. has you know been parachuting aid in, but that's very inefficient. It doesn't get distributed equally. A dozen people have drowned trying to get stuff that fell into the sea. Five people were killed when parachutes didn't open and landed on top of them. When they could simply you know do what could have done what Biden apparently finally did a couple of days ago, and that was to force Israel to actually allow trucks to go in. But again, how much or how long uh, is a question. I want to turn now to what happens when the war is over. Biden says, you know, we, you know, we, this is finally the time to have a two-state solution. Um, but frankly, I don't believe that a Palestinian state alongside Israel. But frankly, I don't believe that Biden really supports a two-state solution. Um, let's let's look at look at this in detail. He only he he only recognizes the state of Israel. But he refuses to join the 130 other nations who have recognized the state of Palestine, something even moderate Zionist groups advocate. In fact, he's pressing really hard for more countries to unilaterally recognize Israel. He set up an entire office in the State Department where a full-time job is to get Arab countries to unilaterally recognize Israel and other countries that unilaterally recognize Israel. At the same time, he just signed to law a bill that would punish UN agencies that recognized Palestine uh, by withholding uh, U.S. aid. He strongly defended the United Nations' role in establishing the state of Israel, but he opposes any United Nations' role in establishing the Palestinian state. He uh, in insists that Israel should control at least 78% of historic Palestine, but insists that the Palestinian demands for the remaining 22% are too much. They need to compromise and allow Israel to, uh, to um, in incorporate big sections of that into, into Israel. Um, he, he's, he's threatened, you know, he, I, 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 he's, he's um, no objection to spending tens of billions of dollars to prop up an Israeli government that opposes Palestine's right to exist. But he's threatened to cut off all relations and all aid to the Palestinian government if they have even one cabinet member who doesn't recognize Israel's right to exist. And Biden even opposes nonviolent civil society efforts to try to uh, end the Israeli occupation, like the use of boycotts and, and, and divestment and sanctions. I mean, Biden supports the occupation so much, he actually sent a State Department lawyer to the International Court of Justice to... Um, uh, I mean, I'll show you know, the, uh, the little background. The Palestine Authority went to the International Court of Justice a few weeks ago to call on the World Court to end Israel's 56-year occupation of the West Bank. And Biden sent its lawyers to The Hague to argue against it, saying that Israel had to hold on to the territory seized during its 1967 invasion because of, quote, Israel's very real security needs. Now, remember, the Palestine Authority in the West Bank has no air force, no navy, no missiles, no heavy military equipment. They have already recognized Israel, offered full security guarantees. They have banned and suppressed Hamas and other terrorist groups. And Israel, by contrast, is one of the most powerful, sophisticated armed forces in the world. Yet the Biden administration insists that Israel should be able to maintain its occupation of that Palestinian uh, territory for security reasons. Meanwhile, in Israel, I, I want to stress that the problem is more than Netanyahu. While the mainstream media and some politicians in the United States acknowledge that Netanyahu and his coalition are extreme, they fail to note that this is, there is no conceivable Israeli coalition government that can replace them that appears at all willing to end the occupation and withdraw troops and settlers from the West Bank and to allow a viable independent Palestinian state to emerge. Indeed, just a few weeks ago, 99 out of the 120 members of the Knesset, Israel's parliament, went on record opposing the establishment of any kind of Palestinian state. Um, I, could, I could go on, but I, I just um, um, want to um, talk briefly, very briefly, about uh, expanding conflicts. I do not think that this war will go into a broader Middle East war, a major one anyway. 
because Frank involving Iran and, and, and other groups, uh, countries, in part because, mainly because the, um, uh, despite Israeli provocations, they've been bombing Lebanon and bombing Syria, you know, and, 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 and the, uh, uh, in the past several months, uh, hoping to bring in Hezbollah and Iranian groups and maybe Iran and, and into the conflict. But um, these groups can just sit back and watch the United States and, and the West have its credibility destroyed by supporting uh, this genocidal war. Um, and it's great political benefit to them. If they took on Israel directly, they get, get smashed. But, um, you know, they, they're they gaining all the political events by actually showing some straight strength. Um, there are a few exceptions. I mean, the, the Houthi guerrillas who um, occupy about two thirds of Yemen right now have launched these uh, missiles to disrupt uh, shipping in the Red Sea in act of solidarity with the Palestinians and the um, U.S. has been bombing them to, to uh, as the U.S. put it, that to, to uh, enforce the law of the sea treaty, which prohibits uh, countries from interfering with international um, maritime commerce, which is a little ironic because the U.S. has refused to ratify the law of the sea treaty, but uh, we're, ready, we're, ready, we're willing to go to war to enforce it. Um, and then there's the whole question about how the Houthis came to power. I wrote an article about that a, a couple of years ago, but basically the U.S. and the Saudi Arabia blocked this massive uh, pro coalition of pro-democracy groups uh, from coming to power during the um, Arab Spring Revolution in 2010, 2011, insisted on um, the, give, handing over power to this uh, general who was the uh, vice president of the previous dictator. And that and, and that was a very unpopular move, which led the Houthis to rise up and, uh, and, and then they seized power. And, and, and it's just a important to remember how U.S. policy can come back to, to, to haunt us. Indeed, Hamas would have never seized power in Gaza were it not for U.S. interference. Um, what the, Hamas had gone from 15% support to nearly 45% support from the signing of the Oslo Agreement until the elections of 2005 uh, because um, the moderation of the Palestine Authority wasn't rewarded. The Hamas was saying, hey, look, you know, you promised uh, Palestine Authority promised we'd have a state within a few years, but the settlements are expanding and Israel's still not willing to have a state. The United States is backing them all the way and blocking the UN from doing any, anything. And um, the Palestine Authority was increasingly seen as corrupt and being prisoners in their own, uh, or jailers in their own prison. Uh, so when they had an election uh, in 2005, Hamas ended up getting, you know, like, um, you know, about 44% of the vote. Uh, the, the way that things were allocated, they actually got a majority in the parliament, some majority. And it was kind of a, a, a mixed system because the Fatah, the more moderate forces, had the um, executive and Hamas had the legislative. And the Bush administration pushed Hama uh, Fatah uh, folks to try to stage a coup to throw them out of government completely. Hamas got wind of it, stage, tried to stage a counter coup. There was this three day civil war. When the smoke cleared, Fatah had exclusive control of the some of the urban areas of the West Bank that Israel had allowed for some autonomy, and Hamas had taken over the Gaza Strip. Again, Hamas would have never controlled the Gaza Strip. We've never had this tragedy were it not for Bush and his his people uh, uh, doing this uh, doing this uh, crazy uh, um, intervention. Uh, there's a very good article in Harper's about that. It has the detail. There's some other, other sources I, I can mention. Anyway, the second kind of expanded conflict comes from uh, uh, Biden bombing uh, Iraq and Syria uh, positions uh, because of some pro-Iranian militia attacks on a uh, U.S. Uh, base uh, in, in, in um, where Jordan borders those uh, two two countries. Um, he said uh, he said that uh, if, if if anybody tries to harm Americans, we will respond. Of course, that's would be news to the um, you know dozen or so Americans that have been killed by Israel, including the aid worker, including Rachel Corey, including uh, uh, Shreen Abu Akhla, the native, uh, prominent journalist, and and, the, and his uh, two, two teenagers I mentioned, uh, who are all here to be targeted killings. But um, at least when it comes to American soldiers, he's willing to <laughs> take military action. Um, these bombings, you know, got, were obviously very much opposed to, not just by the Syrian government, but, but by the Iraqi government, our ostensible allies. Um, but um, 
of course, if Biden was so upset about the presence of Iranian-backed militia in Iraq um, and in Syria, why did he so strongly support invading Iraq in the first place? So we warned him that doing so would lead to a breakdown in central authority that could lead an opening for Iran to exploit. You know, it's almost as if he was looking for an excuse to keep U.S. troops in that oil-rich country indefinitely, along with Air Force units periodically engage in airstrikes to protect them. But that's a whole, whole other story. So I want to conclude uh, by looking, you know, just at, at, at resistance. We're seeing a, a huge, huge protests all over the country, but the people are cracking down on it big time. I mean, I was very active in uh, South African solidarity work and Central America solidarity work uh, uh, when I was in college and grad school, uh, even in the 80s and when I was in grad school under the Reagan era. But, um, and we did massive sit-ins and disruptions and all this kind of stuff you're seeing today. But today it's far worse, the, the level of repression. They never banned any of the Central America, South African solidarity groups, but a whole, a whole series of campuses are banning pro-Palestinian groups, including Jewish-led um, pro-Palestinian groups. Um, students are being outright expelled. Um, they are, um, uh, dozens of states have uh, passed laws uh, you know, punishing advocacy for boycotts and incident and sanctions. Again, there was not, uh, people, people weren't punished for advocating BDS when it came to apartheid South Africa. Uh, even mainstream Democrats are claiming that anti-war activists support terrorism with foreign powers. I mean, Nancy Pelosi claimed in a CNN interview at the end of January that protesters calling for a ceasefire in Gaza were, quote, uh, echoing Mr. Putin's message. I think some are connected to Russia. And she said she would ask the FBI to investigate Russian funding of peace demonstrators. Then two days later, um, a, 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 a video uh, of, of, of anti-war uh, protesters outside her home uh, showed her, they, they were uh, pointing out correctly that the majority of Democrats support a ceasefire in Gaza and Pelosi responded by, to them by saying, go back to China where your headquarters is. Um, I'm, I'm rambling a bit now, let me, let me stop. Um, but I'd be happy to uh, to address any any number of, of, of questions regarding U.S. policy towards Israel, Palestine, elsewhere in the Middle East, um, anti-war organizing, whatever people want to cover. Dr. Zunas, thank you so much for your great presentation today. We really appreciate your knowledge and expertise on this issue. Uh, you've generated a lot of questions from our group today. Uh, some of them uh, are very related. So I'm going to do the best I can to weave in all these different ideas. Professor Zunis, could you please speak to the voters' dilemma in the upcoming presidential election? And this is not to excuse Biden's role in the war. Well, uh, those of us who live in California you know, have the luxury of, um, uh, you know, uh, not feeling obliged to, to vote for, for Biden, uh, given that um, um, you know, Biden's going to win the state by three million votes or more. I will probably vote for Cornell West. Uh, uh, I don't agree with him on everything, but I think he's, he's um, uh, much closer to my values than, 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 than Biden is. I would, I, I, uh, people in swing states, I think that is another, another issue that I think that, that, that given what the very, given the very real threat um, is there that is there of a Trump presidency, which I think really is going to be authoritarian. Some of you may have heard about the Heritage Foundation's 2025 plan about basically um, allowing extractive industries to take over our national parks and uh, um, you know uh, and and virtually all climate you know, uh, 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 climate initiatives and and uh, crack down on civil liberties and basically got the civil service and go down the list. We're talking about serious authoritarianism here. And, you know, but, but again, I, I'm just, as a political scientist, I'm just looking at the numbers and this, this really could Biden's refusal to, to um, listen to the majority of his, his constituents on this issue is, is, is uh, destroying, is, is destroying him. Again, we saw this, what happened to Hubert Humphrey, what happened to John Kerry and got us Nixon and got us another four years of Bush. In certain ways, it happened to Hillary Clinton as well, because her support for the Iraq war and, and uh, other interventions, uh, um, Trump actually tried to outflank her on the left, saying, I will end, I'll stop these endless wars. 
I opposed the Iraq war, which wasn't true, but he said he did. I'll, I'll bring, your, bring, bring the troops home. And uh, if you look at the, um, the districts that went from Obama to Trump, they were they, they correspond almost exactly the, the areas that had the highest casualty rates in the Iraq and, and Afghanistan wars. In fact, I've seen a couple of academic papers which said it was indeed Hillary's hawkishness that uh, led to Trump's uh, victory in, in 2016. So we could have, we could indeed see this uh, uh, happen again. So again, it's all the more urgent that uh, we, we try to get uh, Biden to change his policies. The next question says, you might be right, and I believe that's in reference to the uh, war crimes that could be happening against the Palestinians. Who do you want in power, Biden or Trump? Yeah, again, I, I, if someone put a gun to my head, obviously I'd say, say Biden, but it's also just a very, very uh, sad note to our political system uh, that we are forced to make this, uh, this, this kind okay, of... Okay, so... Kind of most, all right. Thank you for letting us know about that technical problem. And uh, President Joe Biden will show an endorsement from Professor Stephen Zunis. Okay. Um, what about the financial power of APEC and other lobbyists? How is that a factor in the 2024 election? Not a big one, frankly. I mean, um, why do you need? Why would you need money from uh, certain uh, political action committees and and right and those associated right wing lobbyists? It's just to get more votes. But clearly, Biden is losing a lot more votes for his, um, you know, supporting this war than he would uh, 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 um, otherwise. And every every time a president has taken on APAC, the president has won. Eisenhower in the Suez Crisis, Carter in the first invasion of Lebanon, Nix, uh, Reagan in the AWACS sale. Uh, Bush and uh, Bush Senior and the um, the loan guarantees controversy, uh, Obama and the Iran nuclear deal. I mean, uh, uh, lobbies, you know, lo lobbies can influence Congress. I think we'd certainly have more allies in Congress were it not for APAC and peace, peace and human rights people would have more allies in in, uh, in Congress where it weren't for APAC. But uh, Congress is largely reactive on foreign policy. They don't make foreign policy. foreign policy is more uh, that of the um, executive. Um, executive branch. And so I, I really I really uh, think that, uh, um, I mean, obviously there is an organized right-wing Zionist community out there. I've had talks canceled. People they try to get me fired. You know, I've, you know there's been a lot of, um, and, and so I've been a receiving end of, of that sort of thing. So I'm not naive about their existence, but what their, their, their power, I think, is in making it more difficult to change U.S. policy. They make it more difficult to ch successfully challenge U.S. policy. But U.S. foreign policy would be more or less the same even without them. I mean, the U.S. supports Morocco's occupation of, of Western Sahara. Previously, we supported Indonesia's occupation of East Timor and apartheid South Africa's occupation of Namibia. In terms of genocidal wars, we supported Guatemala and their genocide against the indigenous peoples in the 1980s. Turkey and genocide against the Kurds in the 1990s. Uh, again, Indonesia and its genocide in East Timor and Saudi Arabia. I mean, this genocidal war in Yemen just a few years ago. So again, in, in certain ways, Israel's not unique. I think it's important that we not um, uh, you know, act like it is really that different, <laughs> frankly, than U.S. policy elsewhere. And I think, and also just to be care careful again, not to say that APAC it doesn't have clout, not to say it, it's anti-Semitic to criticize APAC. But I think we need to be careful if we exaggerate the power of wealthy Zionist Jews in, 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 in making U.S. policy. It kind of parallels the old anti-Semitic canard of the wealthy Jewish bankers, the wealthy Jewish, you know, whatever, you know, can, and, and you know, putting the blame on them instead of the non-Jewish politicians and power brokers who really have the power. Along those lines, here's a question. If so many people who vote for the Democratic Party candidates oppose what President Biden's stance is, then shouldn't they raise the money and give to his campaign kind of being a larger contribution block of people opposing what's going on? Yeah, I, I don't think in Biden's case, it's about contributions. I really don't. I mean, I think he is a true believer. He is of that older generation of liberals, the immediate post-war generation that has a very sentimental, even romantic view, uh, you might say, of Israel. Um, 
that, you know, the Pucky Kibbutzniks, the, the refugees from the Holocaust, making the desert bloom, uh, creating a social democracy you know, and progressive uh, institutions like the kib Kibbutzim and things like that. I mean, uh, and and uh, even back in the good old days of Israel, I mean, there were still contradictions, there were still racism, they're still doing terrible things to the Palestinians. But, uh, you know, clearly Israel's moved way, way to the right on so many areas. They're so much more overtly racist. They're no longer interested in territorial compromise. But, but I think a lot of people are kind of stuck in that earlier romantic view of Israel. Kind of reminds me of some people on the left, you know, who like want to believe in socialism so much, they'll, they'll rationalize for, um, you know, certain socialist revolutions in the global south that, have ended up being nasty and authoritarian, you know, like Ortega or Maduro or Mugabe or you know, <laughs> or whatever. Or in the old days, Stalin. <laughs> that you know, they they want to believe in the, that they that they're, they're defending an ideal rather than the actual reality, and they recognize a lot of the criticism really is hypocritical and really is is, is dishonest. So you end up dismissing even the legitimate criticism. So I mean, I really think that 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 uh, you know, Biden is part of that that again that older generation of liberals that just really you know, um, want to believe in Israel so bad that they 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 don't they're they're they they just can't don't really see, are are able to see the uh, uh, see the reality on, on the ground. I think it's an ideological thing for him more than anything else. What can Biden do to win back the support of young people of color and Arab American voters? He, he could uh, apply a little tough love on Israel. You know, basically say to Israel, you know, we we. Um, support your right to self-defense, you support your right to exist, you, you support your right to defend yourself from terrorism, but we're not going to you know, give you this blank check to engage in um, these kind of war crimes, you know, do, do what these previous presidents did and threatening to withhold aid and and, um, um, and really, and, 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 and not just stop the war, but really uh, uh, you know, pressed you know, to create a, a, a viable Palestinian state alongside Israel or or, or by national single binational state where both people have guaranteed uh, equal rights, uh, but um, you know, you know, Israel really is looking more and more like an apartheid type situation, and uh, and uh, that's it's going to be very hard for um, uh, for young people to vote for that to, to, to support that. I mean, this this generation. I mean, I think they this is a gener uh, younger younger uh, Americans have have been. Con consciousness is, is raised by the Black Lives Matter movement and related things. So, you know, our generation, my, old, my our generation saw Israel Zionism as kind of a national liberation struggle of an historically oppressed people. And like other national liberation struggles of oppressed people, they could do some nasty things, but, you know, it was a legitimate <laughs> national liberation struggle. This generation looks at Israel-Palestine as Zionism more through the lens of uh, settler colonialism. Um, and uh, they and 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 you know because when, when you look in terms of institutionalized racism and indigenous rights, you, you, you got to look at Israel in a very different light. And so, uh, and so I think think the disagreements with Biden may go beyond simply you know, the, the Gaza war, but uh, you know broader uh, broader perspectives around um, you know, uh, uh, Zionism in, in 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 general, and just hopefully you know he can get them to con to, to condense on yeah have, yeah with that on the. What's at stake for them if, uh, if, if uh, on a domestic level, if Trump becomes president? What do you think of the idea that Netanyahu, in effect, invited the Hamas attack on October 7th by ignoring threats, suppressing intelligence, saying an attack was imminent? Uh, would he have done this so as to re have a rationale for killing and expelling Palestinians in Gaza? Mm -hmm. Well, this is certainly a theory that, that some people in, in the left in Israel have been saying. I don't, I don't see any, or um, um, I haven't seen re any evidence to, to support that myself. But certainly, it was an intelligence failure of, of, uh, of great proportions. Um, and and also, the big pro biggest problem was that he had thirty two brigades of the Israeli armed forces out of Israel in the West Bank supporting these far right settlers, and. Um, um, suppressing the Palestinians, including the Gaza Brigade. So instead of guarding the border, like they should have been, you know, they were in, into, uh, you know, uh, enforcing apartheid on, on the West Bank. And so, you know, I think it, it's, I, I see it similar to 9-11. I mean, there were indeed some serious intelligence failures and there are reactionary forces who took full advantage of it and may on some level have been glad it happened. 
but I haven't seen uh, evidence in either case that it was there was some kind of actual conspiracy. In reference to those uh, 32 brigades that Net Netanyahu um, transferred to the West Bank, do you have any observations on the use of the Hannibal Directive on October 7th, which has led to deaths? Um, and I assume this was this was in terms of the um, of the uh, Israel in terms of trying to uh, uh, reclaim some of the uh, areas that were hit, held by Hamas fighters and ended up shooting pretty much everything that moved, including um, including some Israelis. There was some collateral damage. There were some uh, um, Israelis killed by Israeli forces uh, in retaking uh, uh, Kibbutzim and and, and uh, then the area around the 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 um, uh, the, the, the um, outdoor concert. But those the numbers were relatively small. The vast majority of Israelis killed were indeed killed by Hamas terrorists. Is Prime Minister Netanyahu becoming more or less popular with his constituents in the current situation? Well, his, his popularity is going way down, uh, way down. If there's an election held, he'd, he'd, he'd lose badly in his coalition. In fact, some people suspect one reason he's dragging on the war on is that you know um, Israel is, is not going to have uh, is not going to ha have an election in the middle of the war of a war that's that's been longstanding uh, policy and so the longer the war is uh, on the the um, you know, longer he's prime minister and the longer he stays out of jail and he's facing multiple <laughs> indictments for uh, corruption uh, and 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 the like but again let's let's, let's remember that you know a good eighty percent of Israelis are supporting the war. And uh, you know, and a big majority oppose Palestinian statehood. You know, so the uh, the problem is uh, goes beyond um, beyond Netanyahu, unfortunately. Along those lines, you said eighty percent are supportive. Uh, the question asks if they're supporting the ongoing genocide. One could argue that this is a major factor in allowing Netanyahu to uh, continue committing these crimes. At what point do we start blaming? The entirety of the country for what's happening. I mean, I I don't uh, um, I don't believe in, in blaming the entirety of any country for anything, <laughs> no matter how horrible the uh, the government's uh, policy may be. But the, you know, the problem the problem in Israel is that or they're twofold. One is simply demographics. That the more uh, liberal, secular uh, Israelis tend to have small families, and the more right wing, orthodox, nationalist families that have, uh, have had lots of children, and um, and it doesn't take long before that to, to ref and, and, and since the majority, not all, but the vast majority of people will hold on to uh, the political views similar to their parents, you know, that can, that, that's one reason Israel shifted so far to the left, to, to the right in recent years. I mean, this Labour Party, which dominated Israel during its first uh, 30 years or so, in the way some of us in my generation remember Israel, I mean, they're, they're, a, they're a tiny minority party now. It's the, 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 almost all the parties are to their right. Um, and even labor wasn't quite well ready to, to make the necessary compromises for peace uh, when, when they were in power. Um, so, yeah, and, and the, other, the other reason is that, you know, uh, basically, you know, we've, Israel has moved to the left when they've gotten pressure from the United States, when they've learned there'd be consequences to their behavior. Um, you know, the, the, the pattern, if you look at it, uh, 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 you know, that, but is but the United States in recent a year has given Israel a blank check. So they feel there are no consequences. and go as far to the right as they want, and the, and the U.S. will keep blocking the United Nations from enforcing resolutions. They'll keep sending unconditional military aid. And, you know, if you have no, if you're, you don't see the, any direct consequences for your actions, you'll, you'll, you'll continue the way you're, you're doing. But if you realize there are consequences, then you might support the uh, more moderate or left-wing parties that for, um, uh, ethical or or ideological or pragmatic reasons would would would, uh, would uh, you know support uh, you know policies that would keep your your country in good standing with the United States and the international community. Can you comment on the Iran situation? Netanyahu has access to nuclear weapons, and you're aware that recently there was the bombing of the Iranian consulate in Syria. Uh, do you have concerns that Netanyahu would nuke Iran? Would the U.S. Probably be in favor of this. Yeah, I, I don't think uh, he, he'd, he'd go all out in a nuclear attack, and the United States would certainly not support a, a, a nuclear attack. But uh, the um, you know the the, the um, 
I think he probably would like to provoke a conventional war with uh, Iran, where Israel, again, would have a, 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 a huge military advantage despite its small size. It's somewhat disturbing that uh, Congress, so, I don't know, 15 years ago or so, passed, uh, it was a non-binding, it was an overwhelming bipartisan majority that said not only should the U.S. You know, go to Israel's defense actively militarily, as in join, join the war, in the case uh, of, of uh, Iran attacked Israel, but even if Israel attacked first, you know, so again, you know, it, it's, it's, it's another example of the U.S. encouraging the more hard line um, militaristic elements of Israel instead of the more, uh, more moderate ones. Professor Zunis, uh, you've spurred a lot of questions. Our audience here really appreciates uh, all the great information you're giving. Can you also make sure that you speak up when you're giving the answers? Okay, sure. What do you suggest those of us who've been calling and writing to our elected representatives uh, do uh, now between now and November? Uh, just make it uh, make it clear that um, of, of the objections of what to, of U.S. policy, both on a moral level, legal level, and political level. You know, uh, it might not hurt to threaten to vote third party or threaten not to vote Democratic. I wouldn't. If you're in a swing district or a swing state, uh, I would not advise actually doing that. But uh, you know, on election years, uh, people are certainly um, um, uh, you know, sensitive to that kind of feedback. Uh, and and uh, again, here in California, we can you know, probably safely say that. Um, but uh, you know, they, they do need they do need to to hear from from people and remind how isolated they are. I mean, I think a lot of people, I mean. You know, just just you know, looking at especially if you're going for a, you're writing a Democrat, you know, a, a, a Democratic member of Congress, you can point out just how out of step they are with um, the uh, uh, with their constituents, how out of step they are with Middle East scholars, how out of step they are uh, with uh, you know mainstream religious community, and that they are siding with the right wing Republicans and the fundamentalists, and you really want to be on that side, and 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 that and that sort of thing. Um, I, one thing I should mention about Congress is, is, is that there have been quite a few resignations of staffers uh, in, on Capitol Hill. I uh, mean, young people who just can't, who, who've been seeing these letters, getting these phone calls, and just can't get themselves to defend their boss's position. You know, so this is really causing some uh, some rebellion. And by the way, I'm, I'm just before you get to the next question, just I want to make an offer to um, um, that I have a I have a um, uh, once or twice a month, I, I I send out a little newsletter that has my latest articles. These are, as occasionally I have an academic piece, but most of the time these are little 1,200 to 1,500 kind of policy analysis pieces. Uh, the, most of them are about U.S. policy in the Middle East, though I do cover some other issues as well. And if you are physically there in um, uh, in San Francisco, if someone could get out a sheet where someone could, you could write your um uh, email address clearly as possible because I won't be able to figure out uh, uh, follow up and, and the organizers can hopefully uh, get a screenshot or take a picture of it and send it to me and you can be on my uh, um, uh, uh, email list and uh, for those of you who are online um, you know, maybe you can uh, uh, um, I'm not sure the best way to do it I will um, um, I, I will, I'll, I'll, get, I'll put in my email address and you can uh, 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 write me and and ask to be um, um, put 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 on on the list. I just put it in the chat right now. Thank you very much. And what can we, the people in this room, do this afternoon to change our country's behavior? I mean, I, th I think we. I mean, I've seen uh, you know the, the usual. I mean, the, the way we change U.S. policy in Vietnam, the way we change U.S. policy in Central America, on the nuclear arms race. On South, uh, South Africa, on Iraq, on East Timor, I mean, this is uh, I think, uh, especially in this crowd, I imagine they're they're, they're veterans of of many, and many of these these movements, and and you know the, it, it depends on where you feel your skills are. It depends on where you are, um, you're moved uh, uh, in your heart to do, and for some that is you know uh, letter writing. You know, to the people in Congress or to letters to the editor. Some it's digital. Some it's not, uh, civil disobedience, you know, nonviolent direct action, of um, of various uh, various kinds. Uh, but um, 
you know, I, I think it's really important that you know, Israel and Palestine has often been a very polarized issue. Often it's, it's some very hardcore, um, uh, you know, uh, groups, uh, and some are pretty, pretty kind of extreme in my view. Some, uh, some really are anti-Semitic, uh, though, uh, though I think most of the charges of anti-Semitism are, um, um, are McCarthyistic <laughs> attempts to stifle free speech, but some of these uh, criticisms, unfortunately, are true. And uh, we need to that um, we need to make uh, we need to avoid those who are using this tragedy to advance a bigoted agenda. So we want to be careful about who we work with. But I think you know building a broad coalition and making people clear. You know, I, I personally encourage people not to just you know take do get bogged down in arguments about the nature of Zionism or or insist on a particular political line, but just to appeal to basic decency about human rights, about international law. I mean, this is not radical stuff. This is kind of mainstream liberal stuff, you know, that we, you know, that, 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 that you know, again, we're talking about the United Nations Charter. We're talking about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So we're, we're talking about, uh, you know, enforcing U.S. And, and international law. I mean, this should not be a kind of a radical extreme thing. And I think, well, you know, stressing that, 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 that this is what we're talking about. We're not just talking this is not an ideological thing to go after Israel. This is not about Israel being the world's only Jewish state. Uh, this is about the, the, the same struggles we've had where the U.S. has supported oppressive right-wing allies engaging in, 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 in war crimes and other activities and why we do not, do not believe that kind of thing should be going on in our name or with our tax dollars and with our weapons. In line with that comment about appealing to people's hearts and minds, can American Jews help change? Can American Jews help to change the hearts and minds of the Zionists that are directly occupying the Palestinian territories in the West Bank and Gaza? Well, though the Israel has, Israeli Jews have been moving to the right, American Jews have been moving to the left, and uh, the generation. Uh, I, mean, I talked about the generation gap in the United States. In fact, the the different the, the the gap between young younger people and older people on Israel is is as much a straight line as I've ever seen, except maybe LGBTQ issues. I mean, the older you are, the more pro-Israel you are, the younger you are, the more pro-Palestinian, or at least pro-peace you are. And this is true in the Jewish community as well. A majority of Jews, American Jews, 18 to 30, think Biden is supporting Israel too much. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, and, and having uh, Jews in leadership of these major demonstrations, like the one that blockaded the, the Bay Bridge and some of the more militant ones, led by Jews, sends a very powerful message. Um, and and that, um, you know, it's, this is not, we're not using this as an excuse for anti-Semitism. We are, are, are again, uh, looking at these, these, uh, these basic, um, basic values. And so um, I think that uh, it, it is, um, American Jews do have a particularly important uh, role. I, I, I think uh, for those who are active within mainstream synagogues and mainstream Jewish organizations, I know a lot, a lot of people have given up on <laughs> a lot of progressive Jews have given up on some of those because they're so hard lie on this issue. But you know, there are those who will try to work within the system, work within these established uh, organizations to move them a little bit uh, to a more progressive perspective. Other people have formed alternative Jewish organizations. You know, some that are outright anti-Zionist, but others that are just, you know, simply pro-peace. Uh, but um, it, it's important to have Jewish voices in this this uh, issue. I mean, Jews have often been disproportionately in the forefront of progressive struggles around labor, around uh, 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 civil rights, around anti-war issues and, and, and others. And, uh, and having that progressive Jewish voice is, is particularly important when it comes to Israel. I'm not sure if this question is in your area of expertise. The MK-84 bombs were used extensively by the U.S. military in Vietnam, Iraq, and other campaigns, but online searches do not demonstrate who the manufacturer is, where who manufactures them, or where. Would you have information? Well, that's a very good question, actually. I don't know the answer, but um, you know, other targets of these uh, protests have been uh, um, arms manufacturers there was a, a, a big protest out lucky martin uh, just uh, just the other day and um i think these these are are important you know we remember the blocking the railroad tracks and uh, uh for arms going to central america and, and, and similar protests during the vietnam war and i think it's 
it, I, I particularly like you know, targeting the arms manufacturers because, of course, this is a big bonanza for them. And uh, they also supply repressive Arab governments as well, including the Saudis when they were slaughtering Yemenis by the tens of thousands. Um, so yeah, targeting, again, targeting uh, uh, arms manufacturers are an important step because, again, it, it emphasizes that we're, we're, we're struggling against militarism and repression. This is not simply a matter of unfairly singling out Israel. I'm having a little trouble reading the question, but I think it's very germane. Uh, they heard a uh, report on P PBS that the current head of Hamas witnessed their uncle being shot in the head when he was nine years old in 1956 by occupation soldiers. Uh, isn't the current violence and atrocities against Palestinians just creating more uh, rebels and Hamas recruits? Oh, yeah. I mean, if you look at the recent invasions of countries in the name of anti-terrorism that led to large-scale civilian casualties, it's creating more terrorists. When the Soviets invaded Afghanistan to stop the terrorist Mujahideen, it ended up creating the Taliban. When Israel invaded uh, Lebanon in 1982 to fight the terrorist PLO, it led directly to the creation of Hezbollah. And, of course, when the United States invaded Iraq in the name of the war on terror in 2003, it led directly to the creation of ISIS. So um, even putting aside the moral and legal question, strategically, this is totally counterproductive. And uh, it, is, it, it is not gonna let people be more rational, given the, you know, the fact that they have seen you know, so much uh, death, death and destruction. Professor Steven Zunis, you've given us a wonderful presentation and you've answered a lot of wonderful questions. We have a lot more. Uh, so can we simply get your commitment how much we appreciate you and we want you to come back. Thank you. I'd, I'd love to do that. And again, I'm returning to San Francisco at the end of June. And so I, but next time I can, I can be there in person. Thank you so much. And now we're going to wrap up with Jeff Peckerel. I also want to second John's comments that you are one of our most popular informative presenters. So thank you for making time for us and we hope to see you again. Um, so we'll wrap up with a couple of announcements here. Um, in this room at one o'clock, of course, we have our Janine Freedom Theater fundraising event, lunch, and a great presentation to learn about this very important charity in the occupied West Bank. We hope you'll all come back for that. And on this topic, we have two more presentations lined up. So on May 12th, we'll have Paul LaRudy here from the International Solidarity Movement, someone I know very well. And oh, on May 5th, we have Richard Becker from Answer. He'll be talking probably a little bit more broadly than just Palestine, but talking about concerns of U.S. imperialism and so forth. Um, next Sunday, we have uh, Professor Anthony D'Agostino here to talk to us about Russia and Ukraine in the aftermath, probably, of the recent terrorist incident in Moscow, as well as the killing of uh, the opposition leader Navalny, things like that. It should be a very interesting talk. And on April 21st, we have Joyce Lehrer talking to us about a project called Masculinities, Health, and Social Justice. And on April 28th, we have uh, Wayne Shung here, and he'll be talking about something very different, which is the environment and factory farming of animals. I also want to mention that uh, Art Persinko, who's here in the room, uh, has a sign-up sheet. He's like to involve people in doing a tax day protest talking about militarism. The idea is to go to City Hall steps on tax day and get a protest going there. And he also wants me to inform you about something happening this Tuesday, Save Laguna Honda Hospital, the People's Nursing Home. So that looks like that will also be on the steps of City Hall, 2.30 to 4. Thank you all and hope to see you all next Sunday.